Hey folks, David Stewart here. I realized that the the audio was not on. The desktop audio was missing. So, my apologies. Silence! We got to enjoy the sweet sounds of silence. Instead of the usual chilled out music. Anyway, today we're going to talk about editing and revision, what that means. So, I've gone over this uh, before a bunch of times. Um, so, I say that there's usually four phases to making a book. So we're really going to focus on books today more than uh, any other medium, though I think these lessons apply to other media as well. Editing film is like on a different, totally like different level of discussion, really, I think, than what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so I won't, I won't dive too much into like what revision and editing is on the film side uh, or like games or something like that. but mostly books. So there's four phases to book creation, uh, which is going to be the planning phase, the drafting phase, the editing or revision phase, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And we'll do a little bit of live stuff with the live write things, hopefully get that finished up uh, today. So then uh, I can show you how to put things on Vela. And then number four is publishing. So I guess I'll, we'll, we'll be a little bit in the publishing realm today too. Um, which is good. So what is editing and what is revision? <clears throat> well, this is taking a product that you finished in one sense, which is your um, your draft, like your manuscript, and uh, making it as good a product as it can be prior to it going into publication. So that can mean a whole bunch of different things. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think I'm coming down with a cold. So if I cough or sneeze, that's why. Um, so yes. Uh, there's a bunch of different levels to that. So people who aren't in the business think editing is like finding typos. That's really proofreading. <clears throat> editing is going to be, in fact, I think film editing is, is honestly a pretty decent um, analog to what I'll be talking about, uh, which is that you are choosing what things are gonna go into the final product, first and foremost. That's the first thing you decide when you're editing. What needs to be in the book and what needs to not be in the book. So when you are looking at your whole revision phase, you're gonna be taking a look at all the scenes. Do all the scenes need to be there? Are there scenes which are missing which I must now go back and add? So there's often a lot of writing in a revision phase. And then you're gonna look at, are all the scenes working for the the product in total? What, what we sometimes call um, structure editing and things like that, which is that, uh, is the is the story being served by all the scenes? So you look at each scene. Is this scene contributing to the setting characters and plot? Could it be more efficient? Could we put those things in another scene and then condense the work? Generally speaking, removing things that are unnecessary is going to strengthen a manuscript much more than um, keeping in every little thing that you uh, decided to put in in your drafting phase and it kind of depends what you do in your drafting phase is going to have a big impact on what you do in the revision phase if you did a really good job planning and outlining your work then there's a whole lot less to be done when it comes to the editing phase as far as deciding what scenes should be here and what scenes shouldn't what scenes need to be added what scenes need to be condensed or maybe stuck together um, things like that. So that's the first big thing, the structural edit, where we're deciding what things need to be in the, the story and what things really just don't need to be there. The next level from that is um, going to be making sure that all the details are consistent throughout the text. The characters are the same at the beginning as they are at the end in terms of their overall traits and things like that. Um, so we're looking for consistency of the story. Uh, more than the structure of the story, but consistency. Are the characters acting with the correct motivations throughout the the uh, the work? Am I providing enough information for the audience to understand the plot, or is there something missing um, from this? And then you're going to look at so that you know we did characters and plot. You're also going to look at is there enough information for the setting for people to understand the rules of the game? This is really important if you're writing fantasy or science fiction. Most people err way too much on the other side of things. So rather than, um, rather than not having enough information about their setting, they have way too much. And if you're a new writer, it's really easy to write way too, way too much, especially if you are very inspired by either uh, Tolkien or Sanderson. 
It's not that they write too much, but rather they have a lot in their books that's related to the setting. Um, but if you look at, say, either one of those, they're two very different writers in very different styles, very different time periods that they wrote in. They don't usually include things that aren't necessary to get the entirety of the setting and what's at stake and the rules of the game, if you will. Even Tom Bombadil uh, serves an important role in the overall understanding of what Middle-earth is and who its denizens are, um, including Gandalf. Uh, without just the characters coming out and saying, like, oh yeah, Gandalf is actually like this Maiar, immortal, angelish type of being. You know, so that is something that a lot of beginning writers make a mistake on is they add too much of that and we've got to cut it down. You have to decide how much of that description of the setting is necessary to get the plot across. And then you can cut things down or condense them. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you're opening, if you're opening your story with a bunch of description of your setting, you probably need to put that somewhere else. Um, those are things like that. Now, if you're a new writer, uh, an editor can help you see these things. Say, mm, this needs to go somewhere else. So what does an editor do? So the best analogy I can give for an editor is he's like a band director. And I can say that because I'm both of those things, right? I'm an editor on to some people, right? Uh, I don't offer editing services usually, but uh, you know, I'm an editor, but I'm also, I was a band director. So what does a band director do, right? A lot of times you go to the orchestra and you see a conductor conducting. He's basically keeping time and keeping the orchestra together. He's like a glorified metronome when it's, time for the performance. Yes, he's making lots of moves often, but that is really, uh, that's kind of like the WWE of classical music are what conductors do on the, on the podium. I'll, I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you, let you know something about the sausage, tear the veil away and show the man behind the curtain is that, uh, the truth is if the conductor gave a downbeat and walked off the stage with the professional orchestra, they, they play the piece perfectly. <laughs> They're professionals, right? All of the details about how that performance is going to go have been worked out in rehearsal. So the director, what he's actually doing during rehearsal is taking what's there and crafting a performance out of it. He's deciding uh, what needs to be louder where. Okay, the horns are too loud here. We need less of them. So you guys, I know it says mezzo forte, bring it down a little bit. Uh, we want to go a little slower here, a little faster here. We want, um, you know, the timpani needs to be really muted at this part. It's ringing too loud. So all of those details to put it together into one performance, that's what the director's doing. And that's a lot of what an editor is doing. An editor is taking all those details and saying, hey, this sentence needs to go. This section needs to go over here. You need to rewrite this first chapter. This section is unnecessary. Cut it. This, uh, the way this character is speaking here is not consistent with where it is there. So all the things that I've talked about. It's orchestrating the entire thing into its final form, into its final product. It's taking, because sheet music, we can look at sheet music, and unless you are a really like trained musician, you can't look at sheet music and go, oh, I hear the music, right? Uh, most people are not at that level. Even most professional musicians are not at that level. Rather, it's the sound that we're getting. So that's kind of like what a, an editor is doing, is taking all those details and deciding what needs to be emphasized, what needs to be uh, de-emphasized, what needs to be cut, what needs to be brought up. You know, all of those little decisions will go into um, what you're doing with editing. So sort of breaking down the phases, you think of structure. Are all the scenes that necessary? Do I need to add more scenes? Should I squish some scenes together uh, for brevity and things like that? That's a big structural thing. Um, Basically, do you have all the parts that are in the book necessary to understand the story? That's really important. The next level is getting the characters consistent, getting the setting consistent, making sure that the plot uh, works correctly, that you have all the information necessary for the audience to understand the stakes and all that kind of stuff. And it's easy to miss that stuff with your first draft. It's easy to go back through and be like, you know, and, and, and I'll show you when we look at the, the piece that I live wrote, is that like there's some events that it's like, the impact that this has, like we're not we're not executing this correctly, considering what the later events have. Like characters are not reacting to this event properly, so we need to just go in and add some more details. Just add a, add a detail here, add a detail there, to make sure the audience really knows what's going on with those details. Uh, let me take a quick look at super chats because I think I got a super chat from Scott Lanoon. Thank you. There's no message to it, but I appreciate the super chat. Uh, 
I'm, I may even name a character that uh, I that would kill in the story. I'll name it Scott. Why not? Um, Hardwick asks, what do you think of AI tools to assist in book editing? I have not used them. And in general, I'm going to be a little bit, has, I have like sunlight going on my face, so I may have to close the blinds here in a second. In general, I'm a little bit um, hesitant to, to trust an AI to do any kind of editing work. I will show you something that's really useful you can do with like Grammarly, which uh, Grammarly suggestions are almost always bad. But it's still one of the best spell checkers that you can get is Grammarly. And the reason its suggestions are bad is that it doesn't speak the language as a person does. And it has a style guide that's very modern, which doesn't work for fiction. So while Grammarly might be good for writing emails, particularly if you speak English as a second language, which lots of people do, it's kind of a lingua franca, um, it can be really useful for making sure that you're Email is clear, <laughs> making sure that your maybe your research report is written with a good and consistent nonfiction tone. But for writing fiction, we do a lot more creative work. So having, it'd be like having a spell checker for your, uh, you know, for me playing music and it's like, you know, you're slowing down here. It's like, yes, that's called rubato. Uh, that's intentional and it's annoying that you brought that up and you can't tell what I'm doing. I'm gonna close the blinds here just a second. That's better. No sunlight in the face. A little bit less annoying that way. So yeah, I wouldn't trust AI tools to do it. It's not that you can't use them, but um, I mean, I wouldn't be that afraid to use them because I have a lot of experience and so I'd know when their suggestions are bad. Um, but I think for a new or developing writer, I get like we're, look, we're all looking to save money and not spend a lot of money hiring a professional editor to do work for us. Uh, you know, whatever money you can save is closer you get to being in the in the black with any book sale. You know, keeping your expenses low. It's like I heard someone just like prattle on Twitter. It's like you know, a book costs five to fifteen thousand dollars to make. I'm like, if you're dumb, it t costs that much to make. So like, if you, if you're like, yeah, you have to spend fifteen thousand dollars to make a book. It's like. You realize how many books you have to sell to break even if you're dropping 15 grand on a book. <laughs> like, come on. You can, sp you can spend $0 on a book, which means every sale puts you in the black. You can make more money by spending less um, to an extent, right? Anyway, I get we're all trying to, to like save money. I wouldn't trust them, but you can always see what they suggest. Um, I don't really, I wouldn't really use one personally. And that's because I'm making a creative product that is an expression of me and myself and I. <laughs> and I, I'm a bit of an auteur. Like I have an idea of what I want. I know what I want it to sound like and I know what I want it to work. So the revision phase for me is more about getting it closer to my vision and not um, making myself less bad, if that makes any sense. Like you're always going to make mistakes um, along the way, but you know, it's not a like... I don't need the I don't I don't need someone to tell me that something is good or bad because I just wouldn't take their opinion about it anyway, right? I was like, I know I have this vision for this product. Sometimes the the product that I have a vision for I know is not something that's going to be super popular, and I do it anyway because it's just something I want to make, right? I have the option of doing that, um, and so I take that option. <laughs> I take that option often, but yeah, I mean you can always use it, and if it's not good, then don't take their suggestions, right? Or if they seem like not good, then don't use them, you know? It is Wednesday already, yeah. Tomorrow's Holy Thursday, then Good Friday. Every, it's Holy Week, it's a lot of stuff, you know? Um, so, yeah, um, a lot of drama surrounding Holy Week, you know, Holy Week this year, silly drama. Um, we need to split the word setting between the world and the scenery. So the setting is the, the, the place and the time that a, a story takes place in, right? So where and when, which also determines how things can happen. That's the total of the setting. It's not just the scenery. Um, and it's not just the world, right? So if you're, if you're writing a book that's set in 1930s New York, it's not just the buildings. 
the buildings are not the setting, right? It's everything. It's the people, it's the clothes, it's the attitudes, all that is in the setting as well. Uh, a book is a story. Remove anything that's not the story. This is Brian's advice and it's good. Um, you know, story and plot are not the same. The story is all the stuff that goes into it. All the stuff. <clears throat> Every scene, in my opinion, should be um, advancing the story in some way. So a character is developing somehow. A character is having a revelation or a reflection that is going to impact what they do. Not just have a have an emotion. But that, that emotion is going to affect their decision making later in the story. All right, so that's an example. Let's say you have an aria-like moment. If you guys aren't familiar with, with opera, that's just an opera term. Like the characters reflect on something. So what does that reflection mean? Is it just an emotion? Is it just like a character feeling? Or is it going to affect what the character does? So uh, think of like Uncle Ben dying with Spider-Man. Like Uncle Ben dying affects how Spider-Man, he changes his attitude about the world. So that aria moment is important because it changes future events and that's how our reflective moments with character growth should happen it's like this is going to affect their decision making for like the next part of the plot similarly you should include all the important bits of the setting that you need to understand how the story can proceed but you don't need to include things that aren't relevant to how the story works so you know if you're looking at tolkien whose setting is very rich you're not going to find a bunch of information on Harad. Why? You just don't need to know it, right? At the beginning, you just need to know about the hobbits and the Shire because that's where book one takes place. Uh, and that's just the setup, right? You don't need to know about Harad. You don't need to know about Urun. You don't need to know about Easterlings yet. Um, it just, he still doesn't, even though he includes lots of stuff from the past with the setting, he doesn't actually include things that are irrelevant to the story um, as much as people who hate Tolkien would like to deride him for including too much information. The truth is uh, Tolkien actually writes fairly uh, condensed stories. The amount of story that exists in Lord of the Rings, if like Robert Jordan were to write it, it would be like 10 books long. Okay, it'd be significantly longer with a modern writer versus the way that Tolkien executes his style appropriately. Um, when you're describing a place or a setting, you want to, it's sort of like an establishing shot. What's there and how does that reflect what's going to happen in the scene, right? Uh, maybe it's like a court of a king and you want to describe the beautiful tapestries. You get an idea of richness of history, right? That's how we're, how we're setting the mood with that. What you may not want to include is like the fact that like the goblet had emeralds on it and rubies and sapphires and that she was wearing a set like you don't want to describe every detail if it doesn't change anything about the way people are imagining the scene uh, and that's how you can tell the difference there about what kind of stuff you need to cut about descriptions uh, and i'll fall back on what elmore leonard says which is that people skip prose often but they almost never skip dialogue so if you're looking for something to cut you should always be questioning yourself with your prose like mm, how much of this do i need and how much of it is good and can I lose some of it? You know, can we lose some of it for there? So yeah, I always be trying to do one of those three, setting characters a plot. And the setting, you should be talking about the things that matter to the story, not irrelevant things. You know, it's like Frank Herbert doesn't spend a lot of time talking about all the other populated planets because they're not really relevant to Dune, okay? Even though they're there. They're, they're there in the background. We have an idea that they're there, but we don't really need to know that much about them. We don't even really need to know much about the what's, whatever the first planet was that the Atreides were on. I don't remember what it was called. Uh, anyway, so yeah, you have to make that decision. And then for plot, right, hopefully you're not including things like you don't, you, you may, as far as cutting plot, if you have a, uh, let's say an adventure in the middle of an adventure, that might be a target for cutting. Now I did this once. I wrote basically an adventure in the middle of an adventure where the I felt like the action had lulled and so I just wrote another event and I went back and cut that event out why did I cut it out well I cut that event out I think that this was in Water of Awakening uh, and I'm trying to remember what the event was uh, I think it was like a fight on a farm or something I cut it out because it wasn't going towards the end goal and it wasn't changing anything about the characters it was just like well, I've kind of had a lot of reflection and then they're walking to the next place. Maybe I need some action. But I, on further reflection, I'm like, I don't actually need that. 
that that's not actually it's just like extra events that aren't contributing to the goal of the plot to like resolving the conflict and so they had to go right had to cut those scenes and rewrite that stuff a little bit because you just don't need it right if you're adding 5000 words to your manuscript that is boring to the reader or the reader doesn't think is interesting they could close the book uh you know that's that's a big fear is that you're going to bore the reader so like if you're going to talk about the setting it's got to be stuff that's interesting um, you know who really mastered it was uh, Robert E. Howard. Robert E. Howard could, in a short space, give you all the information you needed about the setting to understand his story and make you want to know more about it and, and evoke feelings of, of like ancient uh, mysteries and snake people and stuff. Lots of cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah, grammar. I wouldn't call Grammarly junk, James. It's good for like editing emails like I have it uh, and it's good because it can like spell check stuff in like if I'm writing a blog post directly into the browser which I don't usually doubt do but um, mostly it's style suggestions are you're gonna 90% leave them but you can still use Grammarly for that 10% you might it'll make you think about like a certain sentence that you wrote hmm it says this sentence isn't clear and you read it and you're like that sentence is crystal clear it's extremely precise Grammarly will think very, very precise sentences are not precise because it wants you to write at a fifth grade reading level. <laughs> and if you're writing like a like with precision, um, it'll often think that a, a, a very precise and complicated sentence is not clear when it actually is like you can't write it any clearer than that. But it, it's all very context sensitive, right? I wouldn't use Grammarly for... A, a dissertation, right? I would rather get somebody like, you know, my advisor to look at the dissertation from an academic eye versus trying to use Grammarly to fix the grammar, you know? Yeah, Grammarly is okay if you're just copy editing nonfiction. I agree with Brian. It'll ruin anything else. It'll ruin style. You don't want to take it stylistic suggestions, except in that it will make you really think about why you wrote a sentence a certain way. If it pops up a sentence like, this is unclear. You're like, why did I write this sentence this way? Read it aloud. That's a, actually a good, uh, here's a good tip for editing. Read your manuscript aloud. You could try recording yourself or, you know, or read it to a friend or something like that. Read it aloud. And you will find that there are sentences that are just, they don't roll off your tongue. Now they could be readable, the person silently reading, but they don't roll off the tongue, in which case, they might feel awkward and you may want to rewrite that sentence. It'll, you'll find lots of little things like that. And you'll find because you have to slow down when you read aloud, you'll find more little grammar mistakes. Like uh, what I tend to do is because I will rewrite a sentence like three times when I'm writing, I'll, I'll have like two ands right next to each other and I won't see them. Like my brain just kind of like filters out the extra and. And then when I read it slowly aloud, and, and, oh, there's two ands there. Cut one of those out. <laughs> Uh, there are some AI editing tools that are more advanced than Grammarly now based on LLM models. Yeah, I'm sure. Some people also use Chat GPT or Claude AI for proofreading now. I probably wouldn't. Uh, well, I would use them for proofreading maybe, right? And I would not, I would do what Grammarly does, which is like, what are you suggesting I change? And I would look closely at it and be like, is that something I need to change? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Speaking of Holy Week, where do you fall in the Christ is King? Christ is King. Jesus Christ is king of heaven and earth. What's the whole what's the whole profession? Jesus Christ was crucified, he died and rose again on the third day and then ascended into heaven, where he sits at the right hand of God as both priest and sacrifice. Yeah, the Christ is king, king drama really centers around uh, people earnestly believing their religion. I can't believe how anti-Semitic it is for you to earnestly believe your religion. What? <laughs> you know that says more about the uh, that says more about the Jews who are offended than it does about the Christians earnestly believing their religion. Same thing with like Mormons. If Mormons said, "Here's my profession of, of Mormon faith," right? I'd be like, "Okay, you earnestly believe that." I disagree, but I'm not offended that you think that you think their your religion is true, right? That doesn't offend me, right? Why would it offend you? 
right? <laughs> it doesn't offend me. It's same thing with like Protestants who are like kind of like get off the, the boat saying like, ah, oh, Martin Luther, they said Martin Luther was right. It's like, okay, I don't think so, but that's okay. I, I don't I don't get upset by that. I don't think you're being like, uh, you know, anti-Catholic by saying, I believe Martin Luther was right. You're being Protestant. You know what I mean? It's different from versus like making all Jews are like this. Okay, well, maybe that's anti-Semitic. <laughs> but not not saying, I believe my religion is true. Isn't that just believing your religion? Um, ChatGPT is good for short segments. Maybe one day it'll help catch uh, plot holes. Hmm. Yeah, the plot holes is another one, right? Um, maybe a character having a tool that, they sh that you didn't introduce. Um, you can catch that once you go back and read it. And I find that if you can... Give yourself a little bit of time distance between when you wrote a piece and when you go back to editing it, you'll find a lot more of those little things versus just like reading it back immediately where everything, you have the whole story still sitting in your head. You're like, I have this perfect story. And you go back and you read it and you forget that you didn't include like the fact that the character had a dagger or something like that. Um, I think my comment was lost due to delay. I tried to respond to your comment about writers including too much info in the setting. In my experience, they talk too much about the world, not scenery. Yeah, okay, that's a good one. That's a really good one. <clears throat> yeah, they tend to talk too much about, here's how the money works. And here's the king. Here's the kings of these 13 kingdoms. And I I was talking to someone, they're like, you know, I have all these clans named off all these places. I'm like, Chances are you won't need to talk about all of them because they won't all be relevant. You can mention that there are 13 clans or that there are many clans in this area. Uh, and they're, each place is named after one. But you don't really need to go into the details of what each one is and what they believe unless you encounter that one in the course of the story. And I kind of have stuff like that in, in like my fantasy world. There's different peoples that are you know more rural. They don't really come into the story, so I don't discuss them uh, until we encounter them. Once you encounter them, then you, yeah, hey, here's these people, and they're like this. Um, Tolkien, again, does this. Like He doesn't talk about the Rohirrim in the first chapter of The Lord of the Rings. He talks about the Rohirrim and their history when you meet them. Then you get to know who they are. These like Viking-like Nordic people with their 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 long blonde hair and their uh, their blonde beards and red beards and their honor culture. Yeah, that's a big big failure of writers. I'm not keen on redescribing characters, but I indulge the scenery around them. Yeah. Robert Jordan, I felt like, was really bad about this as the Wheel of Time books got on, just including way too many superfluous details about characters that we've known a million times. It's like, you know, Nynaeve tugging her braid or like, here's the stitching on this jacket. It's like there's six characters standing around. You have to describe all of their outfits. It's like, we just don't need to know this. I remember the, I think it was book eight, maybe. It began with like um, some Aes Sedai and some Shinarans standing on a ridge and looking out at the scenery. And it was like 10,000 words of them standing there and talking about nothing. And I was like, this is probably the worst book opening I've ever read. I'm trying to remember which one it was. I'm going to look it up. I think it was... Path of Daggers. But it might have been Crossroads at Twilight. I think it was Path of Daggers. It was just like, this is the worst worst book opening I've ever read. Not a single thing. There's no conflict presented. There's nothing that moves forward. It's just descriptions of the, of the place and some characters we don't know and we forget about like by the next page once we get back to the main characters. It was really bad. Like, how did that get through? Well, at that point... He had published a bunch of successful books, so the pressure to make it good wasn't quite there. And his wife was his editor, so she might have been a little too close to the work. And like, I like these characters. It's like, that's great, but what is a reader going to think about this scene? The reader didn't like it. That was me, you know. But you get so invested, like you're seven books into the series, you're like, I kind of got to try to get through this series. Um, you know, things like that. Um, for example, an author who writes thousands of words of plot with no story, see William Gibson. 
Uh, since courts have ruled that copyright doesn't apply to works produced with AI, I wouldn't use it to edit anything I wanted to sell. And I disagree with that ruling, but it is what it is. So that's what Brian says about it. That's an interesting angle. I didn't think about that, but yeah. Um, so for people, <laughs> I was like, uh, people, are like, you can't copyright an AI image. I'm like, so it's like, well, if you use an AI image in your cover, like someone could just use that. I'm like, okay, I don't care about that. <laughs> use it, have fun with it. Who cares? Yeah, grab it. It didn't cost me anything to make. So why do I care? You know, you're not, you're going to, you can use that image. And, and the thing is, is like with stock photos, um, we're City of Silver, right? I used the stock photo image that was really the best one I could use at the time. And I don't have it here. I'll, I'll show it in a second. Here it is. So like this is, I used stock photo images that were the best ones I could get at the time. Um, and we're working on a deadline. This is not a bad cover. This is a pretty decent cover. A lot of people like it. This chap with the sword, he's actually wearing sneakers. That's why I hid him behind the girl in the robe. Um, this is all just a bunch of photos that I like mushed together, like eight or 10 photos that I squished together into this scene that you see. Um, so I can show you the Photoshop document for all that. There's cat hair. The cat's been sleeping on it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so uh, this guy, this chap has been on dozens of fantasy book covers. You can go on Amazon and you can find this exact, this exact stock photo on just like dozens, maybe a hundred, maybe 200 different fantasy book covers. I've seen images that I've used, used on like four different books um, before. It's, it's fine. Uh, the girl is actually a photo composite, so you won't see her, but you may see a different face with this robe on a fantasy book cover you may see this street on a fantasy book cover right you might see this weird planet that i used as a moon um on a some other on a sci-fi cover right so to me it's not that different from from doing stock photos you get them reused like i once i use a stock photo other people can still license that stock photo and use it no big deal right it ends up on a different design, on a different book. It doesn't matter, right? So I actually don't care if someone steals, like, if I make, if I have mid-journey draw a picture. It's like, you stole my AI art. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> Do you use it. If you like that image, cool, use it. Whatever. It, the robot drew it for free. The robot drew it. So pay the robot? I don't know what you want me to tell you. <laughs> You know, I didn't draw it, a robot drew it. I didn't I didn't take this photo. Someone else did. I just mushed it together in Photoshop, Photoshop to make a cover. You know, how can they enforce that? What if I claim I wrote it or made any other things with AI? So well the AIs actually have a record of what they do for the most part, like most of them, unless you're running it locally on your machine. In which case, yeah, there wouldn't be, how would they know? Um, but like for mid journey, mid journey, you can see all the, the, the pictures that other people make. So it'd be pretty obvious because it would be on the mid journey server. Uh, KDP now makes you divulge whether you used AI in any part of your book before they let you publish. Maybe it's an idle threat, but I ain't risking my account. Neither am I. I'm not going to do that. Uh, but they do want you to divulge that. I think most people just ignore it. Um, I've been seeing like more people like, my mom bought me this AI cookbook, this cookbook written by an AI, and it's awful, right? And you're like, you, you, it looks like a cookbook. You open it, and you think it's a cookbook, but it's written really weird and the recipes don't make sense. It's just like someone made an AI write a cookbook and then made an AI make a cover and then put it out on Amazon and some some rube bought it. It's a big problem and I, and I, since Brian's in the chat, you know, neo patronage systems will solve a lot of those problems if we can get more of them going and get more network effects from them, especially where we're more interconnected and the vetting of the artist is because of the network effects. Like this guy knows this guy, knows, you know, so on down the line, because the truth is the days of random people going on Amazon and finding your book and buying it are, we're in the sunset of those. 
the market's very crowded, but it's also crowded with garbage. So eventually what happens is that it gets so crowded with garbage, people lose confidence in their ability to buy something off of Amazon. They need another vetting system. So Neopatronage can provide that vetting system. Then it's not so much about, um, you know, milking the algorithm or having your book content be so exactly to some micro niche that uh, random people will buy it because Amazon sells it to them. That Those days are, we're in the sunset of those days, but rather people will buy things because they know you and have, have vetted you as a person, as a human being, which is better. Then you're not working for robots, you're working for people, which is so much better. It's so much better to work for even one person, right? I am way more motivated to write a book that I think my wife will like than I am motivated to write a book that is part of some theoretical micro niche, micro genre on Amazon that might get me book sales. Uh, do you know what I mean? Uh, you want to write for real people and like what they want and what they can ask you for. Say, I would love a story like this. And people make these requests. Have you thought about doing a story like this? I would love a story like this. Like, that's a great idea. Maybe I should do a story like that because I know there's one person who really wants it and there's chances are there's more versus looking at what people have already bought on Amazon and going like, oh, I'm going to target this and hope Amazon shows it to people. And maybe they do and maybe they don't. Maybe they get it in the wrong category. Maybe the categories break before I finish the book. And maybe ev the entire audience moves on to something else before I finish the book. You know. Thank you for the super chat, Sound Engraver. I do appreciate it. Yeah, trend followers. Um, AIs add metadata and verbal tells that LLM programmers know how to spot. Um, hard to weed out if you're not a pro. Yeah. I, I mean, I can tell AI images really easy. It's like at a glance, you're like, that's AI, right? Um, because I have a lot of experience with them and looking at them and stuff at this point. But I figured this out. This is like a kind of a black pill. Most normies can't tell. So I saw DeviantArt advertising on Twitter. And what they were advertising was like, here's this user who made all this money on DeviantArt selling um, prints. And they were all AI pictures. And all the artists were like, wah, this sucks. It's like, yeah. Um, the really black pill is that people bought those. It's not just that the person typed prompts into Midjourney and got free pictures that they then turned around and sold. And like that that's kind of shysty. It's that people couldn't tell that those were just robot pictures and nobody had actually made them. Um, that's kind of the black pill. And I, I, it's like people who got, got deceived by the whole like Willy Wonka thing. I don't know if you guys remember that. Somebody in, I think it was Scotland, um, put on a Willy Wonka, I don't know, event and used AI pictures to promote it on Facebook. And people thought that's what they were gonna see was these AI pictures of like candy, Candyland stuff. And uh, it wasn't that, it was like a complete scam um, from a guy who, who professionally scams people. But it's like the fact that they couldn't look at those and go, okay, why are you showing me robotic AI images? And they thought that that was somehow real. That's a black pill. It's like most normies are just not that discerning about stuff. They're not looking at those details. They, they don't, they can't put it all together and tell. Um, and it's like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Shadowversity, his like whole AI thing. Here's my AI image. I'm like, it looks like garbage AI. Everything looks like AI. It doesn't look good. And artists tell him that. And it's like, no, I, I think it looks good. It's like, I think you just don't have enough experience with art to like know that this always looks like AI and in a bad way. <laughs> that it actually doesn't look as good as an intermediate artist like drawing a pencil drawing of the same thing. And that if you just typed that same thing into a prompt, it would actually produce a better image than what you're doing because it wouldn't be trying to form, it would make it according to the best art that had already been made and fed into it rather than um, trying to contort to your vision. If you want, if you need it to be your all to our vision, you need to just do it. You need to just learn to draw rather than try to get a robot to draw what your all to our vision is. You just need to execute your vision and leave the robot behind. Use the robot for something dumb like coloring it, right? If, you, if, you, if you're gonna do something, make a background. Uh, robot, draw me a city background. Then you draw on top of it or something like that. <laughs> 
Um, KDP distinguishes between AI assisted, not required to disclose, and AI created, required to disclose. You'll find a page with the rules. I mean, they should really, to me, AI assisted, people are going to torture that to death. They're just going to type something into chat GP and chat GPT and say it was AI assisted. Um, it's like, oh yeah, I, I had the AI write the book and then I edited it. Uh, and for me, just as an artist, I would never use AI tools because I want to, I have a vision I want to create. I, I'm not, I'm not looking to just have a book exist and to sell it to a rube to make money. Like I'm some sort of, uh, I don't know, snake oil salesman. That's like the a complete opposite of who I am and what I want to do. Uh, it's really, uh, it was really a, a, a downer uh, last year and the year before where the first people to jump on this AI train were indie authors. Maybe I could get the AI to write my 12 books a year and I don't have to write them. I can just worry about the, about the Amazon AdWords. I could spend all my time managing the A-B testing of all my ads for, I don't have to write the book anymore. Perfect. I'll just write it and like edit. I'll have the, the robot write it and I'll just like edit it and put it out. My gosh, I can write like 10 books a month. It's like, you're not writing anything. Why, why do you want to do that? <laughs> That's not your vision. It's just what a robot made. How bizarre. I can't understand that mindset except that it's, it's people who want the status of being an author but don't want to actually be an author. Um, they want people to like them and think that they're special for making books, which, but they don't actually want to make the books. It's too much work. And they don't realize that no one really cares anyway. Um, and they don't realize that it's actually less work to just have a normal job. <laughs> what if you what if you used all those marketing skills you have to just do marketing for a company and make a hundred grand a year with for less work and not not scam people? That's really important too, not scam people into buying garbage. Have you heard of the pros from Wonka Scammers AI novels? It's hilarious. At some point, a book became self-aware and referred to itself as a nonfiction. <laughs> I haven't heard this. I mean, at the end of the day, people care that they like the image. Not much thought needs to go beyond that. They just want something they like. Yeah, they look at it and they're like, it's pleasing to me. And that's as much as most people think. I think that's, that's a really accurate way of putting it, actually. Most normies. To be fair, we don't know how many people would have shown up if it were real. How many people clicked away? We don't know. But enough people were fooled. And I, I will tell you from like, and it's probably a numbers game, right? Is that if you can make a thousand, $10,000 a month selling AI images that you put zero effort into, that means that there's a lot of people who are really easily fooled. They just don't, or they just don't care. Um, I want my wife to do my cover art and supplemental art pieces for my series, but she's inexperienced in digital art. I got her the nice drawing tablet, but she still needs practice. Yeah. Everything takes practice, you know. It takes time to develop those skills. Uh, it really does. And you don't have to work in the digital realm, depending on what genre. Like, um, you can have a painting. A decent painting for a cover is good. Just take a really good, high-quality picture of it. And the thing is, like, our smartphones now have, like, such good cameras that you don't... You, chances are you have in your pocket what you already need to take really high-quality uh, pictures of art. Um, you just get really good indirect lighting on the piece and snap a photo with your phone. Um, you know, I got this little Sony phone. It's got a good camera, but I don't even use it for that much stuff. I was like, what do you use the camera for? I'm like, I took this amazing picture of a wasp the other day. And I'm like, this is the best wasp picture I've ever seen in my life. And I'm like, I don't really see that many wasp pictures. I'm not sure who wants to see this wasp. Um, Quote from KDP, if you created the content yourself and used AI-based tools to edit, refine, error check, or otherwise improve the content, then it is considered AI-assisted and not AI-generated. I'm telling you, people are, are just going to say it was AI-assisted even though they had an AI right. And the point is, people aren't going to be honest. And uh, because it's like on the honor system, you're, you're either going to have two things. Either you're just going to have a flood of garbage, which is what's happening now. Um, the honor system hasn't stopped anybody from passing their AI garbage off as normal, or you're going to have some sort of execution of tool that's going to catch people in the crossfire that probably shouldn't be caught. But I will say this about Amazon, right? Amazon has actually been pretty good about, about enforcing its rules in a way that doesn't catch a lot of people in the crossfire. Uh, I've seen artists complain about getting banned. <coughs> 
for click farming and stuff and or you know getting banned like i just got banned for no reason it's like chances are they caught they caught you using click farms or something like that this was a scam three years ago four years ago maybe i'm gonna say four or five years ago um, when they came out with Kindle Unlimited, where people could have a subscription and get as many books as they want that were in the program, uh, the way authors did this is they would hire hire a Chinese click farm to download the book with a, a KU um, account, click through the pages. And in the old days, it was like a bunch of phones and, and you'd have someone just clicking through the pages of the book. So those page reads would rank the book up, which then Amazon would show that as a number one book with the search results for that genre. And then that would try to generate sales. And people got banned for doing that uh, after Amazon caught on to what people were doing, right? You'd pay, you could pay a firm $200 to click up your book to number one, and then hopefully you'd get at least $200 worth of sales off of getting your book to number one that way. Uh, it was all a scam, it wasn't real, right? Uh, so many authors will spend all of their money to rank their book up to then not make the money back on sales, which to me is like, what's the point, right? Well, I, I got people to read the book. Well, you got people to download it. <laughs> you know, that's true. I guess if that's what you want, you want the validation of having people buy the book. It's like, I, you know, what's the point of losing money to, why would I pay money for people to read my book? I don't know. <laughs> So, I mean, I, I think Amazon will, might be able to figure out a way to like actually enforce that. They've been decent about finding ways to enforce that stuff in the past. You know, not perfect, but decent. But if you if you have a tool that like detects AI writing, it may, what if it detects my writing as AI because somebody fed all my books into the AI? I don't know. It could happen, right? We know that the robots crawl the internet. That's how they write all these AI articles. They crawl the internet, uh, just pulling information off of other people's blogs and stuff. So chances are all of my stuff's already been put into whatever AI bots. It's just been ripped off of my sites or all, you know, whatever, you know. At one point, at some point, AI generated stuff will be indistinguishable from man-made. People say that. I don't think we have evidence for that. Because it hasn't happened. It's like saying one day the, the sun will turn blue or the one day the sun will explode. Yeah, I mean, maybe, uh, but are we gonna be around to see it? Uh, what will it look like? You know what I mean? Um, it's like, we don't have any evidence that it will become indistinguishable. That's just a projection. That's just like a, we assume that somehow it will magically become as good as people. It's the same thing people, oh, well, the computer will become self-aware and think like people. It's like, we don't even really know how people think like people. So we don't have any evidence that computers are gonna be able to think like people. We do have, you know, good chat bots that can sort of communicate enough information that people can understand. Or, you know, uh, AIs can be useful for like summarizing information for you and things like that. I think there's a lot of tools that are there, but, um, yeah, dead internet theory coming to life, that's it. It's like, it's all AI articles that don't give you any human information. It's like, I wanna know what a human thought about this product. Nah, what you get is 50 different AI articles with their SEO pumped up to the max, giving you a list of products all with affiliate links. That's what you get. If you're like, hey, uh, does this camera suck? And then you're gonna see 100 articles that use that, that are just trying to sell you that, that or five other cameras. It sucks, but that's how it is. That's why people go to Reddit, even though Reddit sucks. It's like human beings on Reddit. What do you think of this? And then human beings will tell you. <laughs> How do I find humans to communicate with me? It used to be you could assume a human had written the article, but you can't really assume that anymore. You know. Optimizations will get it there. Again, I don't think we have evidence for that. I'm not saying it won't happen. Saying assuming an event will happen in the future that's never happened before. Do you see the problem in that? A lot of people don't. That's why so many experts get predictions wrong, especially on events that have never happened. It's like, hmm, I can predict things that have happened before, like falls of the Republic. What causes a Republic to fall? Well, all of these Republics fell in the same way. So when ours does this, chances are, we're gonna see this next because this has happened in history. You know, you can, you can have a thing. Oh, I think this might happen. 
To clear up any misunderstanding, I'm not debating theory. I'm giving author business advice. Yes. Thank you. Man never thought we could fly. Well, let's say you predicted that man would fly in the next 20 years and it's 1490. Well, you'd be you'd be wrong. Why would you predict that? You know, man will man will journey to the center of the earth. We've never done that. I'm not saying it can't happen, but assuming that things will happen that have never happened before, that's assuming a black swan. Not that wise. And you certainly, you know, I wouldn't hitch my wagon to that idea or that the idea that it being quote indistinguishable what does that mean that that's going to mean people don't write anymore right the point of writing is that it's a human writing it that you're getting a human perspective not a computer's perspective right the computer can't write my story because it's not me it's as simple as that <laughs> if you want to take it great if not great best of luck Well, I, I probably wouldn't use any AI to edit things because like I said, I have an artistic vision. My goal is to see that artistic vision through not to have a robot tell me what it thinks best practices are. I don't care about what the robot thinks. The robot exists to serve me, not the other way around. <laughs> It'll cause a market crash from a collapse of trust. Now that's an interesting thing. That is That would happen, right? You can expect something like that. Different kinds of markets will collapse because of a collapse of trust. I think we're seeing that with the internet now. Like, I think Amazon is having a collapse of trust because of the influx of AI-generated stuff. Not that the AI-generated stuff is indistinguishable, but that it's bad. Um, so it, when it becomes indistinguishable, what will people do? Will people just stop buying books because they don't like robots? or what? I don't know. I don't know how people would react to that if, if the writing actually became the same as what a human would write. I don't think it ever could because it can't be a person, right? They can't have a person's perspective. It can emulate what's already come before. Uh, but I don't, I don't know if a computer can even like properly synthesize things the way a person would, right? I, I don't know if, they, if that's even possible. It's the way I'm thinking of it. Anyway, let's hop over and let's look at a story that I did the live write on and we'll finish revising it. I have a couple things I want to accomplish with this story, so we will attempt to do those. <laughs> we will attempt to do those as best we can. I bet Amazon will start screening for quality out of necessity. Now that would be an interesting, see, before it was always like you let the, the users decide the quality. It's the users who are going to decide the quality of everything. Um, and that was their whole spiel. It's like anybody could make it because, um, you know, anybody could have the, you know, the, there's no, there's no editor, right? There's no editorial at some publishing company stopping you from writing whatever you want to write. To me, that would remove the big appeal of publishing at books on Amazon. You might as well just have a publisher at that point, you know? Um, and I don't even know how they would do that. Uh, if, it, if it got out of control, it would have to be like you, you'd have... I could imagine, so I can imagine a system while I'm thinking about it that's similar to how music distribution works. So those of you who aren't in the music business, I'm in lots of businesses, it's dumb. Not in lots, I'm in like two. <laughs> um, anyway, the way here's the way music distribution works. Here's how music gets on Spotify. And you can find my music on Spotify under Zool or David V. Stewart's Zool. You uh, can't just upload your music to Spotify. Spotify doesn't do that. Apple Music doesn't do that. You have to have a distributor that uploads your music for you and you have to pay them to do it. Then they will pay you royalties based on plays. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? So you can use a service like DistroKid or CD Baby. I've used both of them. Uh, I wouldn't use CD Baby again for just some really silly reasons uh but uh distro kid is fine you have to pay them like a you know so much money a month or a year and then you can 
they'll put your songs on Spotify. So I could imagine something like that with Amazon where you have to have some sort of trusted distributor that will run basic quality checks on what you're doing. And DistroKid will run basic quality checks on stuff. Uh, sometimes it's metadata, metadata that it doesn't understand. Like I had this where it wouldn't upload this 50 minute long track I recorded uh, because it thought it was like an ambient noise track for some reason. It's all music. It's 100% music. It's improvisational music. It's got like jazz and all kinds of stuff in it. But like because of the metadata, because I was calling it Rain, it's, that was its title. And originally the, it wasn't Rain. It was like The Sound of Rain. That's the title, right? It's like, this, what's, what's the title of the track? That's the title. Okay, I'm weird. But because of that metadata, it wouldn't upload it because Spotify doesn't want that. Understandable. I just had to change the name of the track to get Spotify to take it. So I could imagine something like that happening with, hey doll, hello, you're cute. You can't see the cute dog. Uh, I can imagine something like that happening with, with books where you have to pay a distributor. So basically there's like a, a publisher of record that's not Amazon in order to avoid that stuff. What do you want, honey bud? Okay, well, come here. You can, you can get on camera here. Say hello. I'm the dog. I don't know what you want. In 1903, the New York Times estimated that uh, invented a working flying machine would take between 1 million and 10 million years. <laughs> Six weeks later, the Wright brothers took flight. Yeah, that's why you don't want to predict those things. I'm not saying you, it's not going to happen. I'm not saying, I'm just saying like, you probably shouldn't predict things that have never happened before. It's it would be like, you know, we don't know where we are in the timeline. If someone predicted there's going to be human powered flight, I might find some Middle Ages writer who said men would be flying by the year 1500. Then it's like, well, you were wrong, right? That why would you predict that? Um, you know, so yeah, lots of things have happened that haven't happened before. But why would you want to go on on a limb and say they're going to be? This is definitely going to happen. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not in the way that you're thinking. <laughs> Yeah, CD Baby was cool when they manufactured CDs, not anymore. So this was a thing with CD Baby was like, okay, <clears throat> we'll sell your physical CD. It's not great. I'm like, okay. So how, it's like, here's how you have to sell your physical CDs is uh, we mail you the CDs and then you mail them back to us. I'm like, that's dumb. It's like, well, our manufacturing facility is across the street from our warehouse. It's like, you can't just send them across the street. It's like, no, you have to send them to our warehouse if you want us to stock them for sale on Amazon. It's like, what am I paying you for? <laughs> it's like, I'm not paying you for anything. It's dumb. Um, they also like messed up one of the encodings on my CDs. So like one of the tracks is messed up, but whatever. Whatever. So I don't recommend them now. Uh, you can also tell like their, their like help videos have like dudes, hairy dudes in dresses. And it's like it tells you just how serious they are about their about their business. <laughs> yeah, you're not very serious. Um, so anyway, that's my thoughts on CD Baby. I don't hate them or anything. They just uh, I wouldn't use them. I I would look for another another service. Okay, let's. Oops, dang it! Come on, Windows. I didn't want that put all the way across the screen. There we go. All right, let's take a look at this. There's a chat there. It's a doge. All right, Sorcerer's Blood, I think that's what we came up with. All right, <clears throat> not sure where we stopped. Oh, there was something I wanted to fix, which is um, basically he kills this guard. And so one of the things that you have to think about is like, what's the impact of this event? Because killing somebody that the other two characters know is not going to make them very merciful, right? Whereas if he doesn't kill him, it you know it will kind of allow them you know allow them to be more merciful, or he has to have a big reaction to it. And then they have to, the other characters have to acknowledge that the guard was killed. 
right? And so I think maybe having it have a big impact, like he's really surprised at how it makes him feel. And then having the characters also at least acknowledge that and kind of deal with that fallout, that's more like what I think I want to do for this one. Let's see, let's find it. I think I put a I think I put a note here. Under review. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Should he kill this man or not? So I made a little note to myself. Of harm. Let's do brain. Still, almost the death sounds better. Again, these are like little, little detail things. What program are you using, and is it specifically designed for novel writing? This is Microsoft Word. So yes, it's specifically designed for novel writing. <laughs> this is Microsoft Word. You can get. Um, on Woot right now, you can get um, a complete copy of Microsoft Word, I think 2019 for like $20. So just buy that. You know, you don't have to do the 365 thing. Uh, I do it because me and my wife both use the cloud uh, saving features to move stuff between all kinds of different computers and things. Um, most people don't need that, don't need that. Draw from my belt. We don't need that. I drew my favorite rondel. We don't need from my belt. You know? Let's see here. Let me think about this. Maybe I struck in the right place. I'm talking about it punctures the lungs. Here we go. The interchange disturbed me. I stubbornly stay with Office 2010 because I've always hated that flat looking theme. It's actually been proven that flat, um, the flat design language is worse than the old, old style. People have a harder time knowing what is actually selected and not with flat design language. It's actually been, I believe it's been studied to be like objectively harder to use <laughs> than like the bubbles. Um, Yeah. 
So we have this. I want these characters to have a different reaction. Let's see, who gave a super chat? We can name him Scott. It's a really simple, simple name. Yeah, I want to introduce this. Scott is such a common modern name. I don't think I want to use it. Like I'll name a character that dies after you. What's Scott usually short for? It's just a word. It means the Scott, right? I'll just name him Scott. <laughs> I say, I imagine she's actually in the, she's living in the house, so she may be not, she may not have seen them. So actually, she probably wouldn't know. Um, No, maybe they do. Let me look. Let me look up a little bit here. No, no, this is right after. This is right after the event. Uh huh. Seems too light. That is part of it. The boy put his ear to my chest. It felt exceptionally warm. I hear nothing, he said after a moment. You believe me now, Ruland? I never disbelieved you, Hesty. Again, I think he tries to speak. Can you hear? A little. Tell me, stranger, do you have a name? He says he is Xander. Who sent you to kill me? Oh, I don't think you need, need ask that. I wonder if he knows what he is. Very well. Did you know that you are a half-man? Half-man. I grew angry. It was not half of anything. I was maybe going to change Murdrag's name, I think, too. Gorthak. Gorthak strikes you dead. I was living in the moment, I thought, because of my skills and training, and I realized I could not recall ever having been taught. Yeah, we have to address that he did that he that he still killed the, the guard. 
probably be right here. Yeah. Is Dear Gesh in this book? Not directly. No. No. Not as a character, like in the in the other book. Sounds so quiet, the boy said. As the small of Roland, think of how he is to someone without your senses. A person who is half there, half missing. Yes, okay. I was living in the moment, I thought. Yes, okay. Am I really a half man? Yes, Hesty answered immediately, but you still hold some part of humanity. Whatever and whoever you are, you walk here and in the land of the dead at once. You are an echo of a man. What do we do with him? said the boy. Ah, oh, that is the problem. We can offer him release from this body. But to what end? Half of his soul is bound here. He has a mind and a will and he speaks. Yes, he does. Tell me, assassin, what stopped you from cutting cutting out the heart of young Rudland? I tried breathing, and the feeling was uncanny. I thought he looked too innocent to kill. I thought I had killed a child before, but I couldn't remember anything. She nodded, and her posture collapsed. Her light hair fell around her face, and Rudland caught her and guided her into a nearby chair. I will tell you what I think is true. You were made by Murdrag, or else purchased by him and put to work. But inside you survives some memory, some small thing, perhaps, that remains human. And to that end, you have your own will. You are yourself, though you cannot remember it. The usurper is not as skilled as he thinks. I believe there is a way you could be made whole. Murdrag would have kept some part of the ritual to bind you to this realm. But maybe not. If not, would you have us slay you, so you could at least have a chance at release? I pondered this. I would be whole, but not for my own sake. For one I love, but Murdrag has her. The plot thickens, but that as well. How do you intend to get her back? By providing the heart of the boy. Yes, but you didn't do that. Then I don't know. You could kill Murdrag, Rulin said. Would you kill the man who enslaved you? If you really did so. Well, since you can think. Hestia said, you must consider whether he did. Either way, do you think he deserves death, holding your loved one as hostage? Yes. Perhaps you can use him, Ruland. This may be the opportunity we've hoped for, since your father delivered you into my care. 
the same nature that makes him so ethereal here will work against his master now that he has free will. Are you suggesting we hire a half-man? Can anyone do such a thing? I'm suggesting you recruit him. What could we offer him exactly? He must have life before money matters to him. What about the ritual? Do we have the knowledge to reverse it? Hestia, still invisible pain, smiled. I believe so. But we must first discern the nature of this thraldom or attempted thraldom. I have studied these things, not out of evil desire, mind you. Youthful curiosity and a life too full of silence. Could he pass the doors? You might have to come too. The blood of the king still runs in your veins, and those ancient doors will still yield to you. I know it's dangerous, but clearly we are not safe in hiding. Rulin put up his chin and swallowed. And you? I will come too. Very well. Rulin turned back to regard me. I will offer you this, Sander. You will take me to your king and you will dispose of him. Well, then have Hestia undo the spell that binds you, either giving you life or death. What if Murdrag's captive? My my words faltered. Can only guarantee the same, Hestia said, life or death according to what is right. It is better to die than to live a half life, or so I have assumed. What do you think? I paused. There was thought in me. I had a voice, and I felt it was mine echoing through the empty corridors of my mind. Yet for every door I opened, I found only empty space and more echoes, half memories of things that I could not say were real. Did I enjoy being alive? Would I prefer death? I cannot remember what life is, I said at last, but half-life, can you think of the now? What do I compare it to? I don't like my own voice going in circles. Then what do you say? What if I refuse? Then we find a way to release you now. An end, or a chance at a beginning, or a chance to remember, too. What do you say? Will you kill the bringer of your tragedy? My voice was swift, darting through the empty space, and to my lips to answer, I will kill him. Is there an oath that would bind a half-man? Rulin said. Does he respect the gods or even know who they are? The boy turned to regard me, and he seemed old beyond his years. What god do you know? Grim. The child actually laughed. Verbus then fitting. Why? Poetry and death, Sander. But that you remember him is good enough. Swear then, said Hestia, and I will bind it so. By Grim, God of Words and the Dead, I will kill Murdrag if you will attempt to restore me. Hestia laid a hand on my head. It felt hot, and I realized suddenly wet with blood. With that blood from the wound I gave her, she drew something, but I could not see what. Now we shall see you, and we will see whether oaths hold shallow, shadow men. I must attend to my own injuries now, or I will be useless. Ruland turned to her and bent down, the reality of her wound striking his face with a grimace. Um, he placed his hand on her side where I had struck her. must rest. Forgive me for not seeing how bad it was. We had other concerns. Do not worry too much. I do not need rest. I do need rest, but wake me in the light. 
She flicked a hand at me and I went limp once more. Forgive me for not trusting you or my own powers just yet. In the light, when the shadow recedes, we will see how you are. All right, let's see. All right. Good, and then we go uh, we go straight over to Solborg, I think. No, no, this is them leaving the city. This is them leaving the city. Honey bun, can I kick you out? You are really warm in my lap. Like a little heater, pups. No, you have to sit there. So you're right as dog. Yeah. Why don't you go get a drink from here? Come on. She's upset that I kicked her out. I'm gonna turn on the fan. Turn the slide down a little bit. It's bright. There we go. Okay. Oh, got about 30 more minutes to spend on this. We'll see how much we can get done. The guard at the city gate did not seem to notice me where I sat. Perched on the back of a mare between Ruland and Hestia, the mage woman stood up straight in the saddle, but she looked pale and drawn, and there were dark bags under her bright eyes. The sun beat down on us, and though I could barely... Let's make sure we know what we're doing. As we may exit. Actually, it'd probably be... No. Oh, we made our exit from the city. The mage woman stood up straight in the saddle, but she looked pale and drawn. The sun beat down on us, and though I could barely feel its warmth, it was making me feel woozy and disconnected. I felt dim, and the world seemed dim as well, like I was a ghost wandering passively through the realm of the dead, and yet I knew the trees and the grass were alive. Brightest seemed Hestia, and I pondered it in my ruined state. Of the shadows around me, shadows in the sun, she was the most real, the least shadowy. Let's do another one. I felt guilt, something familiar and alien for the wound I had inflicted upon her. Yeah, what are they doing with the guard's body? We left Fiskerhole dressed as humble travelers, a woman with her child and some packages on another beast, or perhaps a third person if anyone was strong enough of perception to see me. I saw many eyes in the hamlets, but not of them. None of them looked at my face, dark as it was beneath the hood of my cloak. The sun, wrong sun. The sun crossed the sky and we wandered into the shade of great oaks and I felt a great relief. Um, I felt relief. Uh, to my left, I could hear the soft gurgling of the river and birdsong. Can you hear me? I said aloud. Rulin turned his head to regard me. I can hear you. The gateman did not seem to notice me. I had something to do with that, Hestia said. You were already so dim, a thing that is not easily noticed, but I used an extra bit of magic. I did not want them to notice our departure, as there are people in this town who know our faces, if not our names. Remember that somebody had told you, had, had told your master of our presence here in exile. We traveled on, and shadows grew along with thoughts that were of
Hestia and Ruland rode next to each other, talking softly. Ruland was very concerned about her health. Whenever they saw that I might be listening, they grew quiet, so I could only piece together the depth of her injury. Because of the weapon I used, it, was clo it closed only slowly, and she was becoming exhausted spiritually after the manner of mages. At times I thought she might fall asleep in the saddle, and her body drooped, but she remained awake through all. As the shadows lengthened and the westering sun peeked through the limbs and hid our eyes, we came across a small house off the road and within the canopy of ancient hardwoods. And within a canopy. I followed them to it, and there they bartered for some vittles while I stayed back with the baggage. And we went on. Or then we went on. Rulin handed me half a loaf of bread. I held it in my hands and gazed curiously at it. I had a half memory of eating something like it, but I had no recollection of ever eating recently. As an experiment, I tore off a piece and put it in my mouth. Everything felt dry and bland. I would say tasteless, but the only thing I could really taste was a bitter and ugly undercurrent of flavor, like ashes from a cold pipe or a burnt piece of gristle. <laughs> I forced myself to swallow the bite, and it felt like a stone in my stomach. You can eat then, said Hestia. Surprising. Do you still think you are not a half-man? I stayed silent. We made camp beside the river. Hestia busied herself with drawing wards around the clearing, which had, by the looks of it, served as a waypoint for many, for many travelers before. Rulin lit a fire of brush and other easily gathered kindling, and to my surprise it burned bright and long, consuming the fuel much slower than it ought to have. Hestia cooked a small meal of fresh chicken acquired from the farm. This time they did not offer me any, but ate quietly together. I'm going to say chicken giblets. <laughs> then Hestia lay down on a pad of blankets and slept. To me she looked like the dead where she lay. Her breast moved so slightly I wondered if she really were dying. But as I stared, I noticed life grow in her, and I was again struck by the feeling that she was bright and all else was dim and hazy. Do you require sleep? Lynn said. I don't know. I am accustomed to rest, I think. There are times in which I do not remember much, if anything. Well, you can stay up and watch if you aren't tired. Aren't you more awake at night? I haven't thought much of it. You seem drained by the sun is all. Are you tired? No. Then you keep watch. I have not used myself like my caretaker. I have not... But I am very tired. Are you really only a boy? Rulin smiled at me. I am a boy, but I have more cares than other boys. Hestia says I act too old. Do you think I am acting too old? I cannot tell... I cannot tell you how to do otherwise, but you don't always seem like a child, except that you look very kind and innocent. Thanks. Let's say thank you instead. I think I will try to sleep. You keep watch. You trust me. Ruland once again smiled. You swore by a god and a serious one. He can reach into the land of the dead, so he will hold you to your oath. He too slept soundly and softly. The fire slowly reduced itself to embers. Then stones that glowed warm by their own life or some magic the woman had imbued them with. The air was still, and the mist began to gather by the banks of the slow-moving river. In that mist, I saw the moving shapes of men. Let's do a better word than moving. Twisting. Shapes of men, wandering by, their white eyes downcast. Some wore ghostly arms and carried broken shields. There were a few women there, too, carrying in their arms bundles of nothingness in the imitation of babies. I remained still as I watched them. Occasionally, one would look toward me and hold my gaze for a fleeting few moments before continuing on. I determined later that my vision was seeing outside of the world that is. From outside the world that is. To that underworld which is a reflection of it, where the unforgiven dead wander trying to settle their unfinished lives. <laughs> Boop, boop, boop. All right. 
There was a horror to the vision, but it touched me only remotely, for I knew at that point that I was one of them, among them, a shade of a living body. The wind came with the dawn, and with it the mist blew away, revealing a clear black stream under a gray sky. Rain was coming. So be actually chapter eight, rebreak. So by rebreak, I'm going to break it into several chapters because this one, um, if I do select heading and content, it's six thousand words, which is way too much. So we're gonna we're gonna break these into um, what are these th about thousand word segments, and then we'll put it on Kindle Vela. I may do that in another stream because I think I'll run out of time tonight. I, I talk too much about other things. Um, Solborg stood like a heap of rubble, a drowned pile of black rocks in the constant drizzling colorless rain. A few wisps of smoke curled up before being lost in the infinite dark gray, the only trace of life within the great city. The outer walls were tall and menacing, but few men stood there. All I could see was a lone sentry above the, gate, above the gatehouse, standing morose under a wide-brimmed hat rather than a helmet of steel. From the hill where we stood, protected from the rain and the ambient light by an ancient drooping oak, it looked like a dead city. Now is the time for you to perform your first action, half-man, Xander, said Hestia. She had once again become drawn and pale, but the corners of her mouth were upturned with some hidden cheer. And what is that service? You must go open the gates for us. It should not be too difficult. They will not notice you. Should I kill the men? If you have to, as it is, it seems they are rather lackadaisical. Perhaps just go scare the horses and we will follow you in, eh? I dismounted and walked toward the gates. The rain, like usual, did not touch me as much as it should, and I felt neither wet nor dry as I walked forward. The outer hamlets were nearly deserted. I only saw one old woman emptying a chamber pot, and she took no notice of me. Several houses looked empty or abandoned, with no smoke curling from their, from their leaning chimneys. The gates were formidable, but not closed tightly because of the in and out movement of people and goods that characterize most large cities that have spilled their fortified bounds. I slipped past the sleepy guard, huddled under an overhang, and into the gatehouse. The portcullis was half raised, enough to allow men to pass, or perhaps horses with no riders. I worked quickly. I stepped back outside and approached the leaning guard. His eyes were open, and he looked out on the muted landscape with a bored expression. With a single stroke of my club, I bent him over. The second stroke hit the back of his skull, and he crumpled silently to the floor. I rolled him off the side and into, the cluster of bram into a cluster of brambles, then went back inside. Past the portcullis was a narrow stair to the upper room. I went up and found nobody inside. A ladder led up to the upper deck uh, and the parapet. I went up it. I went up and found another soldier standing there. He was whittling a wooden block with a small sharp blade. I did to him what I did to the other. Let's do the first. Did you have to kill him? Wulin asked when he caught uh, back up when he caught back up to me outside the city gate. They will live, probably, I replied. I cannot account for swelling of the brain. But what is it to you? These men were once servants of my father. <laughs> You ask interesting questions for a half-man, Hestia said. Let us move in quickly and find a quiet spot. She looked more drawn and exhausted than ever. What is the matter, Wulin said. I will tell you in a moment. Let us go first. She walked up the narrow street, which wound around a hill capped with ancient mansions. The way was narrow and dark. Shadows stretched from the walls of the houses, which were built practically on top of one another, to nearly the middle of the street. Instinctively, I stayed in the shadow of the westernmost wall. Like the hamlets, few people showed themselves. Those who did were bent and apprehensive. They turned their eyes away, especially from me, and were willing only to glance occasionally at my companions. The road wound past a great empty space. My memory suggested it was once a park. But it was now a great empty space of gray tumbled stone and barren dirt that was nearly as colorless. 
A wide dais was raised in the center of the space, made of crude and ugly black bricks piled up in an orderly fashion to make a wide circle. Within were the charred remains of what I did not want to guess. Rulin sighed. I looked back at him to see a darkened face that looked old, even on one so young. Hestia almost fell and Rulin caught her. What is wrong? I asked. The mage looked up at me and smiled, but her eyes were wet. This place has been deeply perverted, Rulin said. Can you not smell it? I had not been paying attention to such a sense, and only when I focused did I realize did I realize there was, wafting through the air over the stuffy smell of city life, a penetrating stench of burned dung and flesh. Perhaps pork, that's human flesh. Dear Gash prefers certain kinds of sacrifices, Hestia said. You can guess them well enough, half man. Perhaps you were one once. Undoubtedly, I said but not like these burned ashes. That would be better, perhaps. I paused and stared at the altar, for that is what it was, and thought of Tarilla. I turned to the hill of old stone houses with iron gates. Tiny fortresses. Okay. My wife has to run over to my mom's house because her cat got out. We'll try to find her cat. We got coyotes, so cat has to not be outside the house if we want the cat to live. I had memories of her chambers, her halls, but not how I had gotten there. Period. We must move on and mourn the lost later, Hestia croaked. I cannot stand here for, for long. I put my shoulder under her arm and carried her forward. She felt light, hardly any burden at all. Though I could not say if it was because of my nature or that she possessed a body smaller than her flowing robes might have suggested. The road turned and went to the fortress, the black citadel at the top of the hill that stood backed to a cliff that fell some hundred and fifty feet into a woody and rocky end. It was not an evil place once, Ruland said, but where are the people and the guard? You had one answer back there, I said. This place is as hollow as my breast. The approach to the castle went over a pit that was now full of sewage and mud. At the bottom, I could see the remains of various forgotten defense works, such as charred spikes and broken stone walls. From the pit rose the black walls. Of the outer wards, menacing and tall. A bridge ran to those walls and an impressive gatehouse. Um... Yeah, in an impressive gatehouse with an... Uh, we don't have to say to those walls. Uh, ran, bridge ran to an impressive gatehouse with an iron shod drawbridge, which was down. Here we pause, for though there were no outward... Uh, there was... There we go, yes. There was no outward sign of, po of a post guard. Um... There was a feeling that I picked up on. It was oppressive and swooning, and I could see that it affected Ruland as well. It was as if we could not look at the gates without feeling nauseated or losing visual track of the stones. Here is where I can do my last service for now, Hestia said, the words coming in mnemonic fits. Murdrag has placed wards in lieu of men. There will be more inside, but I can go no further. What is wrong? Ruland said. You have not been honest with me. I thought it was perhaps the altar before, but it is the Dark Lord himself. As I grow closer, I'm gonna call him the Withered Lord. That's better because he is withered. As I grow closer, I lose something. It is a pain and a weakness. I still feel the prim strong within me, but I cannot lift my arms. It is some trick he has gained from the Unbinder. Now, release me, Xander, just for a moment. I eased myself away from her, and she stood up straight. A light was in her eyes, and she held out her hand and spoke strange words in an alien tongue, or else a tongue that only she knew the meaning of, but the meaning was clear and true. The air rippled before me, and the uneasy sensation At the same time, there was a kind of snap in our heads and feet, and Hestia cried out. I caught her again, and her eyes rolled in her head. The wards have all been released, but I am spent. You must go on without me. If I have done well, the betrayer will not 
uh, not have felt me unwind his traps. But Ruland, you must go cautiously and remember the lessons I taught you. Reach out with your inner senses and you will see his traps. If all else fails, send the half-man, as even the beings of the dream will have a hard time seeing him. I carried her in my arms to a pile of rubble near a dead yew tree. Her warmth seemed gone, but she breathed still. I laid her against the trunk and placed, uh, placed over her my cloak. Her bright eyes were closed, and she seemed at peace. Now, I could say, and placed my cloak over her, but I thought I had better placed over her my cloak. It's just a different feeling. I have never needed a disguise, I said, and tightened my van braces. We went back to the bridge, and things felt suddenly bright and clear. I could see the sun just breaking through a bank of gray clouds. I will walk close to you for now, Xander. When they attack us, it will be me they see and not you. You must not be merciful, as there are none here worth saving. All of them are ashes now. Then why go on to rule the kingdom of ashes? If that is my destiny, I shall rule it. At the least, we must understand that justice makes its own demands of our dreams, and must and we must fulfill them or else risk losing ourselves. Moreover, plague spread. Already this disease has found me in my hiding place. What heart I have grieves that you were not a boy. better place for an M dash that what child you ought to be maybe at the end of all things I will get that back too we stepped across the bridge from the shadows stepped two dark figures wearing mail of tarnished black they were not men but something else of gray skin and sallow wide eyes I hit the first one with my club and was inwardly surprised to see his helm crumple and his head come apart, spilling unclean, uncertain contents. He did not buckle, but swung a strange, curved sword, not at me, but at Ruland. The boy dodged back well in time. I turned my attention to the other creature, whose face, burned in my memory, looked like melted wax with the gray eyes of an old corpse. My short sword was already in my hand, and with a swift stab, it ended the unholy image. The blade went through the nose and sank into the head like it was mud. I stepped back. The first figure, its head spilling out gray matter that could not have been brains, flailed wildly. I kicked at its feet, and the joint there bent awkwardly. With my sword, I chopped at its shoulder, crushing the bones in a sickly manner. No, I'm sick of the matter. How about a sickening crunch? Then withdrew my wet blade and sliced the head clean from the shoulder. Like a dead chicken, it stumbled forward and continued to move, not merely twitch, as if it were still as if it still willed something. The second figure was on its knees, grasping at the ruin that was its face. I kicked it over and smashed the horrid... Uh... Truly, they could not have been men. Their innards were a jumble of meat and gray nothing flesh. Had I been fully a man, I should have wretched. I would have wretched. Ruland stood back, trembling. What are these things? Lost? Oh. Uh, lost ones, he said with a quavering voice. I half remembered old tales of lost beings drawn or cast from the Fey lands or in rebellion against whatever holds sway in that eternally changing place, and how they walked and lived as imitations of men. As I did. I looked at Ruland and knew that then, whatever poise and maturity he had shown earlier, he was still a boy. 
He had a dagger drawn from his belt that looked like a gladius in his small, white hands. Stay close to me, but not too close. Let us hope you shall not need that, because even my blade does little to them. How does he command them? How, does, how did he command me? It's a little italics. Boop. That is different. I imagine it is less different than you think. Don't look at them. Do you remember the castle? I have no memory of it. There is a passage that leads out to the cliff. It's a sewer, really. It is near the larder and kitchens, if you can ever find those. I will hope for you instead. We entered the first ward. A lone horse stood in the dirt, its hazy eyes regarding us, and I wondered whether it was alive. I saw that Ruland was covering his mouth with his shirt and intuited that there must be a great stench about the place. As we worked around the courtyard, staying in the shadows, it became more obvious that we were in the rotten heart of a rotten city. Let's need another word besides rotten. Dead. The kings. <laughs> Piles of detritus were heaped against the dark walls of the massive towering keep. Bones protruded here and there, but because of the black filth covering them, I could not tell if they were man or the remains of beasts slaughtered and thrown away. One of these piles stood near us as we approached the inner gatehouse, and the bones were white and not yet fully bleached, picked clean of meat. The outer gatehouse was bereft of life save for two man-shaped sentries. I pushed Rulin behind me and led... Um, behind a broken wagon near a set of stables holding gray, ugly horses. Decayed. Decaying city. I watched the two sentries for a few moments. They, like the others, were not human, and yet were not animated corpses or some other sorcery. Their eyes were hazy in the veiled light, indistinct. I've used hazy a lot. Um, milky. Haha. <laughs> milky in the veiled light, indistinct in their tissues, so they looked more like the gray bulbs of fishes than the eyes of men. And yet their faces were man-shaped, noses and brows and filthy sparse beards hung over chests coated in dark mail. Noses and brows. We gotta separate those things. Filthy, otherwise it's like their noses and brows hang over their chest coated in dark mail. A disturbance in the air held me back, a faint sound below normal hearing. Did you hear something? I whispered. Rulin nodded. I wish Hestia were here. With a loud screech, the portcullis moved upward, grinding and scraping the way neglected rusty metal does when it is forced to move. The great doors were flung open and out stepped a horde of great, and he's great, of large, beastly men of uncertain race. I would have guessed Dreisen or Orcs, but these were more mannish with long black beards and yellow eyes. Unlike the beings that were sentries, these men had a burning intellect in their eyes. They shouted a strange tongue to each other and trotted up to the stables. In a strange tongue. Where they gathered up the poor pale beasts and mounted them. Where? said one of them in the tongue I knew. Just search. Mere say so. Kill if you want. No eat. The others laughed and said something in their own strange dialect. Their own dialect, then spurred their horses to the front gate, where they would find the dead sentries. Now, I whispered, and dashed across the courtyard, just as the last whipping tail disappeared around the wall. The first lost one, for I know not what else to call the putrid and mocking body of the fey being, did not react to me. Perhaps those fish-like eyes could not perceive anything, or perhaps, let's say not perceive anything, let's just say perceive nothing. Or 
or perhaps my nature worked better on them than on regular men. I lopped his head from his shoulders and turned to the second creature, who cried wordlessly in some emotion. Let's just say he emoted wordlessly. A mockery of the human feeling like his face was a mockery of man. With my club, I crushed his sternum, or what should have been his breastbone. His chest collapsed like soft bread, but the cry continued. I slammed my sword into his neck, and he collapsed. Instead of blood, a spurt of liquid, nearly black and already congealed, rushed out and spilled on the ground, where it quivered as if alive. <laughs> I motioned for Rulin to follow me inside. Once we were in, I threw the release on the portcullis. It fell down with a deafening shriek. Just then, one of the riders returned and shouted for the others in his perverse language. I did not wait to see what they would try to move. Um, in order to move the iron portcullis. Instead, I pushed the great doors closed and threw the bar across with some effort. We were now inside the keep, and it was very dark. Light came in small patches from narrow windows down the hallways, but I knew where I was going. We walked forward into the noisome darkness and away from the sparse light of the narrow windows and arrow slits of the outer wall. Okay, let me let me check this. I'm going to find about a thousand words and see where's a good place to do a break. 808, 958. Fifteen hundred. We'll put nine here. <laughs> um, we could also let's see. Let's, how many words is this? About five hundred. Yeah. This might be a better break right here. Actually, I'm going to put it here. Um, this one as all this goes across nicely How about that and then we'll do 10 And these will break up really nice if I want to put them on um, Kindle Vela, which I'm not going to have time to do tonight, but we'll do it on another stream so I can show people that. As long as I... Ah, yes. 
We walk forward into the noisome darkness and away from the sparse light of the narrow windows and arrow slits from the outer walls. Once we entered the gallery of night, our eyes adjusted, and we saw that it was lit by strange lanterns of uncertain design, globular and swirling with internal enchantment, hanging from the black ceiling by long dark ropes. Before us stood an immense door of ironwood and shod by um, ironwood shod by strips of copper and steel. There was no pull ring or knob anywhere on it, nor was there any keyhole, bar, or mechanical device. Or it's unlocking or opening. Ah, uh, here it is, I said. It is your blood that will open the way. How? the boy asked. I ran my hands over the ancient wood and wondered. Perhaps try touching it. Rulin held out his hand and touched the seam between the doors. They vibrated, but did not open. I drew my dagger and held it out to the boy. He took it and, with great apprehension, put the point in the middle of his palm. Okay, he already has a dagger. So this is a detail. rather than holding on his dagger. I saw into a long gallery. I had only a vague memory of it, and it appeared darker than in my mind, lit again by those uncanny globes, which here put forth a light of palest ye green-yellow, a vomitous and phlegmatic hue that haunted the vision more than it gave light to the ebony floor, which reflected them back in sharp, dazzling points. Arches lined the way, and beneath them, backed by marble no less dark than the floor, were grotesque paintings um, and sculptures, idols of gods I could not remember, nor could I remember the others, as I realized at the moment. On seeing their visages would never want to. One looked like a goat with the body of a pregnant woman, but all the proportions were miscast. Another was a sculpture of the coital act, but in revolting forms with many figures. Have you given any thought to doing a stream about the preparation phase of writing? I kind of get stuck in there before I even get to drafting. Um, Eats and Chronicles don't have that problem. Yeah. Uh, I've done it with the, the live write stuff, uh, but I can do like... Uh, you know, it's it's really about planning all the macro stuff. And so we can do like a little guided thing, like pick your setting, character, plot, get that set up, and then we can outline a bunch of scenes and then go from there. Works pretty good. Revolting forms with many figures, paintings of unspeakable acts of horror and visceral violence hung between these more real than what the hand of an artisan could make. The blood pooling in there still... The blood pooling... 
cooling below their still forms was in contrast to the floor. Was. To put another word for dirty. Filthy in contrast to the floor, which was immaculate, free of dust. At last we reached another, another, another door. Ruland was painting, panting and cradling his hand. This one, like the other, had no visible means of opening from without. It, however, was carved with a bas-relief of Baroque design, detailing two intertwining forms, a serpent of golden hue and a woman of fair visage, who had upon her fixed face a look of longing or passion. Ruland, shaking, put his bloody hand to the door and screamed. I moved to silence him, but in a moment the cry stopped. The door drew his, drew his blood from him, and light flowed through the bas-relief like glowing water. It opened. Here's where my memory intruded. When I saw that vast room with its ugly light filtering down from uncertain heights and its raised dais, the center of all my life, I shuddered, for I realized that it was my first memory. How many men can remember being born? I will close the door, I whispered. With little effort, the door silently swung shut, and we heard a long latching sound like a portcullis slamming into stone. It reverberated in the room, and I quailed. He is not here, but he is not alone, I said softly. But we are not alone. Look, more of the lost ones. Out of the uncertain shadows at the edge of the great room lumbered several black figures, draped in chains and mail and holding heavy curved swords. Where's Murdrak? In his own chamber somewhere beyond, I said, not knowing if that was true. He would not spend all day upon his throne. There is power there you cannot feel, half-man. Ignore it. I will deal with these monsters. You take this. I handed him back my dagger. The one Murdrak, I handed him my dagger the one Murdrag himself had given to me. You must search for the exit. If I fall, do not come back for me. Death is a mercy. so small and innocent fixed his face in a determined scowl as he held up the dagger. I am scared. I am too. I'll stay close as long as I can. No, they will be drawn to you, not to me, and you must stay away from them. Do you know what they want? I don't want to. I ran out into the spectral light, drawing both of my more familiar weapons. Only one of the beings noticed me, a man-shaped creature with eyes brighter than the others though still dim and corpse-like. Offer, he said. It was not a question, nor a statement, just a word. He swung his sword at me, his arm clad in black chains, bent in ways no man's should. And it unnerved me. The blade nearly cut me, and I slid to the side just in time. Kill! He knew the meaning of that word, and stabbed at me. It was unpredictable, but slow. I hit the arm just past the hand with my sword. I felt, more than heard, the flesh and bone beneath crumple. The hand twisted limply down, still holding the sword. I kicked at him, and he went sprawling. Two more, blinder than him, ran toward me, not lumbering like zombies, but like men possessed of fell spirits. I ran to one side, making for a fourth man, with long, limp hair trailing out of his dark helm. He held a spear and was walking toward what I suspected was Ruland, still moving in the shadows and searching for the next room. I ran him through the chest. The male gave way easily, and his flesh was soft as bread. Let's think. I used I used that analogy before. Something other than bread. Rotten fruit. Ha ha. The wound, like the others, only phased him, and while he flailed on the end of my sword, trying vainly to turn his pike toward me. 
I crushed his misshapen face with my club. The other two were on me. I found the way out, came the shrill voice of Ruland. I dropped into a crouch and sprang at the two monstrous men slashing at their legs. I felt blows, but no pain as I ran past them. They, they fell sprawling on the floor, their legs twisting and bleeding out a gray-black sledge that gave forth a noxious odor. There are more, I said. I can hear them, but they are somewhere above us on the balcony that encircles this hazy room. This is it, Ruland said. I saw that he stood before a blank, curved section of the wall, with a tall, iconic painting hanging on it. It was of a woman, but of uncouth pose, revealing the details of her sex. Where? I could feel it. Let me see how long we've got here. There we go. That one, I'm gonna to try to finish this up. And I gotta put the kids to bed. All right. <sighs> I could feel it. Ruin pressed his hand, still bleeding far more than it should have. His sleeve was soaked red on already, from just the small prick to a spot just past the painting. The wall moved and slid away, revealing a long, narrow hallway. Light swirled within, but I could not see from whence. We stepped in, me in the lead. I held my sword in a forward guard, stooped and ready. I was vaguely aware of damage to my body, but I, but it was distant and only my sense of doom was immediately palpable. The way opened to another small hallway and a few large doors, one of which stood ajar. I crept forward and I still, and I stood still at what I saw. Inside was what would have been a bedchamber to a sane man, but was to Murdrag a place of foul inversions of rest. He was there. It's called the Withered Lord sitting on a chair not unlike the way I had last seen him. He looked less alive than ever. Have to catch this one on the replay. I have to help my family tonight. Well, thank you for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Uh, he was there, the withered lord, sitting on a chair not unlike the way I had last seen him. He looked less alive than ever, but also less wizened. It was as if his sagging skin had hardened like dripping wax. His eyes were black and sharp as they regarded me, not with surprise or venom, but with amusement. The look was maddening, but more so what I saw beside him, robed in red, with a sheet of golden hair running over her shoulders and chest. It was Tarilla. I recognized her at once, but she seemed as amused as Murdrag. But she did not seem... Tarilla, I said. She laughed, her lips crimson as blood. You were right, my lord. He has done just as you said. Murdrag stood up and drew his black robes around his body. Good, good. You trust me more? I never distrust it, but what good is an advisor when she cannot voice alternative outcomes? Murdrag laughed. True. Xander, bring me the boy. I am here to kill you. No, you are not. You are here to bring me the heart of the boy, and now you have... True, I expected it in the sack I gave you, but living and full of his precious blood is just as good. Better, even. The box, I said without thinking. Murdrag laughed. See the limitations of their minds. Clever and yet so simple. He can look upon you and still believe what I told you. I know it is my heart in that box. I said. Oh, good. Then bring me the boy and I shall give you back your heart. He looked at Trilla, and my body will grow as it was again, and I can share my secrets with you. I moved forward, ready to strike the old man, but Trilla stepped between us. Don't you want to know who you are? she said. I froze. 
I turned my head and saw out of the corner of my eye Ruland, who was cowering near the entrance, gripping my dagger with both his hands. Was Tarilla my lover? Did she deliver me unto Murdrak? Was she really the lover of that abdo um, let's use a different word, let's use consort, of that abominable corpse man who laughed at me in his melting gray flesh? I dipped my head and dodged around Trilla, content in never knowing the answer. With all my strength, I plunged my blade into Murdrag. It was notched by my fighting, and the flesh and bone within, for he had a human body, whatever else he had, resisted it. Yeah, resisted. I felt the sudden pain of relief, which disappeared as Murdrag turned. Um... blade still buried in his back, the point sticking out from his sternum. His strength was sudden and incredible, something impossible given the state of his aged body. I saw as he faced me that no blood flowed from the grooves of my sword. Then I heard his dry laughter, made all the more sickening by some leak in his lungs provided by my strike. I saw as he faced me. No, just leave that. We'll leave that clause. I saw as he faced me that no blood flowed from the grooves of my sword. Then I heard his dry laughter, made all the more sickening by some leak in his lungs provided by my strike. Produced. You fool, you cannot kill a man like me with just a sword. I am beyond hearts and blood, beyond life and death, just like you, but stronger. Something bowled me over to the ground. Vague and distant pain brought me to the realization that my clothes were on fire. I rolled away, smothering the flames. Bring me the boy, croaked the old wizard. Trilla moved toward Ruland, who held out his dagger feebly. Tears were running down his white cheeks. From a belt within her flowing crimson robes, my lover drew a dagger no less vicious. No, it must be a dagger attuned to my blood. I pulled myself back to my feet and launched myself at Trilla. Ruland, use the dagger, I gasped. The boy only dodged away from Tarilla. I tackled her. We rolled there for a moment, me unarmed, for I had dropped my club. Perhaps I was unwilling to use it on my love even then. And her flash, and her flashing... was unarmed. She was flashing a dagger at my face. I felt the blade contact me several times as I gripped her wrists, trying to subdue her. I felt another hot flash and was flying backward. assumed. The pain in my body was more present than ever, but I ignored it and struggled to my feet. Murdrag, from the side, looked to be casting some sort of spell from his lips as he pushed the sword out of his chest. Drops of fresh blood flowed over the edges into the hilt as he awkwardly wrenched it clean from his body. The wounds, black and gray, dried as he ran his hands over the blade. Did you find the cat? Did you find the cat? Yeah, I got the cat. 
Okay. All right, we're almost done. <laughs> For the seven of you that are watching. And then we will call it. Okay. All right. Um, hmm. Tarilla was moving toward me, laughing hysterically. Rulin was nowhere to be seen. I wondered if he would have the courage now when the Dark Lord, let's call him the Withered Lord. I don't like Dark Lord. Withered. Withered Lord was busy, and when Tarilla was focused, focused on me to use that dagger, primed with his royal blood to end the undead menace that sat upon the throne of Soltborg. An idea occurred to me. I let Tarilla come on, casting one more weak spell of fire that singed my clothes, and stepped up in a weak stance, my arms out, and I let her plunge her dagger into my breast. I felt the point enter, and the stiff edges push my ribs apart. I felt the blade slide through me, cutting the air from my lungs, and then stop against some other bone. But I had no heart. Tarilla's face, maddened with anger and delight, stared into my eyes. I pushed her forward, letting my weight, however little it was, as a mere half-man, fall upon her frame. My hands gripped her throat, so white and pure, like a porcelain figure, or perhaps a tiny marble idol of some goddess. Alright, I don't think I'm going to leave this one to 1600, because it's a good chapter. Murdrag approached, my sword in his hands. It glowed now with a red light, sickly and wet. I saw, too, that Rulin crept around the back of the room. Tarilla's eyes glanced that way, and she tried to unseat me with renewed vigor. I pushed my knees against her chest and increased my grip, lest she escape and undo this last chance. Her hands beat against my chest impotently as she choked and sputtered. Murdrag raised his sword to strike. Whatever I was, surely I would die if my head left my body. I closed my eyes and prepared for the end, content that I tried my best. At that moment, Ruland, the boy, the child that should have been playing with his friends in the paths of the town, or sleeping beneath shady trees, stepped forward and struck. He buried my dagger to the hilt in the side of Murdrag. The old man, the wretch, gasped, and a torrent of blood escaped from the wound. He seemed frozen in his grimmest death scene, like the grotesque paintings he had used to decorate his hall. Looking down at Tarilla, I could see that with her lips she was attempting to cast some spell. All her focus was on Ruland. I could feel distantly the power of some magic called from the prim welling beneath me. With a pain of deep regret, in spite of myself and my false memories, I renewed my grip on her throat so that she could speak no more. In the corner of my eye, I saw Murdrag toppled forward. Again, I croaked. Ruland, Ruland withdrew the dagger as best he could, and with his trembling boy hand struck again at the wound I had made in his chest. This time the stab drew blood, and it flowed out like wine from all the wounds. Murdrag croaked and coughed. My sword at last fell from his hands. I released Tarilla and stood up. I picked up my sword, shining red, and with one stroke severed the head of the... All the lights went out, save for the pulsing. In that darkness, I did not have to look upon the body of Tarilla, for I knew that I had slain her. After a few moments, a candle sprang to life. It was a little thing, and it was in Rulin's hand. His face looked placid and calm, but no longer that of a child. Hestia will need the box, he said. Forget it, I said. My voice was a pain to use. No, that was our agreement. I was forced to look upon the dead body of the woman I loved, or thought I loved, and was told to love. I didn't know which was true, and I still do not. But even though she was cavorting with the source of all my ills, I felt for her. 
The feelings I had, whatever they might have really been, were as real as any feelings. No, if they We searched the room. My heart hurt for the boy, now king of a ruined country, but he was king in his honor. King in his honor. We found it eventually among many other treasures that one uh, that would one day, if he had the power to control what was left, need to be cataloged, purified, Need to be cataloged, purified, or destroyed. It was weighty in my hands. On the box. Uh, which I could tell, uh, it was weighty in my hands, which I could tell were growing weak with my otherwise mortal wounds. I could feel more than hear my heart within. Rulin, holding aloft the small candle he had lit with his meager skill at magic, led me back into the great circular hall. I saw in the dim gray light from the windows high above the figures of the lost ones, standing idly, staring off in confusion, unbound. The doors opened for us without craving blood. I realized the men who had charged off into the city would still be there. I bid Rulin stop and return to the horrible chamber, where I retrieved the severed head of Murdrag, looking more like an aged and withered man than the corpse it really had been all along. When we reached the doors, I knocked off the bar and threw them wide. The strange men, or half-orcs, were there, lazing about at the bottom of the steps. Here's your lord, I said, and flung the head at them. I doubt his skull will pay you anything more. Get you gone. They jumped away from the severed head and cried out in revulsion. One of them said something to another in their own tongue. They looked at, a mo looked at me for a moment, bloodied and carrying a crimson sword. Then they ran toward the front gate, where the others were. I wonder if they were frightened or happy to be free, Rulin said. Both, I said. All right, here's the last chapter. Then we're, we're done with this read-through. What we'll do uh, next time is we will uh, do a proofread, looking for typos, and like a little, we'll use uh, Grammarly to guide that. And then we will put it up on uh, Kindle Vela to see if we can make any money. And we'll also format this document for like a little mini paperback. So that's what we'll do on the live rights. Or maybe I'll do that like next time on the right stream. I don't know. In the next stream that I do. Either Saturday or next Wednesday. In the, where was I? In the dim firelight of the little hall, what once was a temple and long forsaken by the former Lord of Solborg, Hestia did a work that I could not understand. My eyes were hazy. The forgotten images of the gods swirled above me from their shrines in the small pantheon. One of these had her eyes cast down, and it was as if she looked at me. It was Nostera, a fitting goddess of health, though I did not know it at the time. Then all I saw were eyes of white looking at me, almost blinking in the flickering flames. Hestia, by some ancient art, opened my chest and placed back within it the beating heart of my life and my soul. I drifted from where I lay until I saw that it was day, and a blue sky with white clouds filled my vision in the portal at the top of the dome. It's actually an oculus. My breath came in raggedly, and I was afflicted by an overwhelming thirst. There Hestia gave me water, lifting my head so I could drink it. It was cold so that it, it was so cold that it hurt, and I realized in a wave of catharsis that such pleasure and such pain were new and living things that I had no real memory of. You must have gone into the castle, I said, or did you know these forbidden arts already? I didn't, but nor did I enter into the accursed keep. Even in Murdrag's death, it is too violent a spiritual place for me to endure for long. I was given the right by my patron. No, do not ask, because I cannot tell. Thank you. So what do I do now? There we go. Whatever you wish, you are free, and I mean really free. But I still do not know who I am. You are who you are. Hestia said with a smile. She laid her long hand on my head. I cannot remember, and Terilla would not tell me. I thought I would remember. What was done to you cannot be fully undone. You are no longer a half-man, but man, and so you can live as one. 
Oops. And so you must live as one. Whatever life you had before and whatever memories it carried, the loss of these does not make you less of a man or less of yourself. The future is yours. I lay there for a time with Hestia's hand on my brow, looking up at the temple and wondering how my life would go. I was like a babe newborn, but with the body and the mind of a man. I wondered too about Ruland. The same blood that flowed in him had flowed into the ruined veins, flowed in the ruined veins of Murtrak. What power would it hold over him, if any? Having seen such horror, would he repeat it? I am sorry Rulin has gone through so much. I would have avoided it if I could, Hestia said, but he is strong. As if knowing my thoughts, she said, he came from a long line of good kings and good sorcerers in their own right. The descendants of the men of old. I cannot say how Murdrag fell but for temptation, and I will do my best to save Rulin from it. I nodded from where I lay then folded my hands upon my sore chest and felt the stitches there. Hestia stood up and went to another corner. Softly she began to sing a song I had never yet heard, in a tongue I did not understand. Watching the clouds drift by and listening to the wind and the faint echoes of bird song, I closed my eyes as a man. All right, that's the end of the, the book. Um, so that's it. Uh, this last one is a little short, but it all evens out. Um, I'm going to get rid of this. And we'll turn these into Roman numerals. Uh, this is actually, what, 13. Okay. So uh, later, what I'm going to do is probably delete all of these notes and stuff. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, select heading and content. Do uh, select heading and content, whatever. We'll just do all this. We will exit. And then I have another document that is some revision stuff. And there we go. Okay, so it's the total amount is oops. Oh yeah, there we go. Last thing. The end. Period. And there we go. There it is. Fifteen thousand three hundred and two words. We will ship that. We're going to put it on Kindle Vela first. I'll do that on stream. And then um, I'll show you how to format this for a little mini paperback. Should be fun. So uh, thanks for watching, folks. I'll see you all next time. I got to go I've when I've stayed a little over long to finish this up. Didn't seem like a lot of people hung around, but that's okay. I wasn't saying a lot of interesting stuff. I was staring at a document. But we will do um, all that work on a live write maybe later this week. So if you're around, you can hang out with me and I will show that and I will probably edit that into a video on demand, a separate video that people can watch if they want to see every single step of uploading something to uh, Kindle Vela, just like I did for the other Kindle steps, which people really like. They like to see someone just doing it, not saying do this, but showing where you click and what you enter into every field. So we'll do that next time and I will see you all later. Have a great, great day.